thank you very much, and thank you for coming out to join us this morning. Um, I often phrase the introduction to this research in terms of something uh, that Simon and Clara Shast did a number of years ago. I usually don't have Simon sitting on the uh, front table with me when I do this. <laughs> but yeah. for those of you who, who may <laughs> recall, um, about 10 years ago, a little bit less than 10 years ago now, uh, Simon and Clara Shast and several other people came out with a very influential paper for this business uh, of sort of responding to f humanitarian food security crises called Missing the Point. Uh, and it was about humanitarian food security interventions, mainly in sort of the Great Lakes uh, region of, of, uh, of Central and Eastern Africa, Uganda, Burundi, uh, Rwanda, Congo, and a couple of other places. And there were, th there were several points that, that stuck out to me in that, in that research, and I've always sort of taken it as a baseline for what we're doing in this business. But, but the, the sort of key finding, I mean, Simon may disagree with me on this, but th the key findings that came out to me was that, first of all, the programs that they looked at in that research were actually not based <laughs> on analysis. They, in many cases, were ignoring information where information existed, and they tended to be based on, on sort of ready-to-go, off-the-shelf interventions, and mainly, mainly three, um, food assistance, or food aid in this case, um, nutritional support in terms, of, uh, in terms of blended foods, et cetera, or else if it was deemed to be a livelihoods uh, problem, seeds and fools. And not surprisingly, uh, most of these programs were not having very much impact. Now, that was 2004. I suppose the research was done a little earlier than that. Since about 2005, we've made a huge effort, number one, to improve analysis in this business. And I'm thinking of things like the SENAC project that um, WFP undertook to improve uh, assessment tools and assessment findings and make assessment results more transparent the integrated phase classification, uh, the development of a number of indicators, et cetera. And at the same time, our options for response have, have changed dramatically. One could say that in 2004 or before, there actually wasn't that much of a need for response analysis because there weren't that many response options. But I'd like to try to convince you, if you're not already, that um, things have changed. In, in um, in the last 10 years or so, th there have been four major changes in, in the way we can do programming in response to food security crises. First of all, what was once predominantly in-kind food assistance uh, that came in-kind from donor countries has now largely shifted away from in-kind donations to cash donations, but still earmarked for um, in-kind transfers. And much of this is done by purchasing that in-kind assistance, i.e. food, either in the recipient country itself or in a nearby country, so-called triangular uh, or regional purchase. Um, the blue here shows um, direct transfers from the donor country. Red and green show uh, local purchase or third country purchases nearby. And as you can see over time, the proportion uh, that is, that is uh, d directly donated by the, by the uh, source country has declined dramatically. The second one, of course, uh, which HPG and ODI generally have done a lot of work on, is the shift away from in-kind assistance and towards uh, cash or voucher assistance. The third is about a much broader range of livelihood responses than just seeds and tools. And the fourth one, of course, is a complete revolution in nutrition programming. Now, all of these require making choices. And hence, whereas maybe 10 years ago you could argue that there wasn't much of a choice to be made and therefore response analysis was not such an issue, I think now there is. Secondly, um, donor resources have changed as well. This graph uh, shows you the changes in U.S. funding. And of course, the U.S. was famous for only providing in-kind food assistance for years and years and providing it uh, in a sort of a pro-cyclical way rather than a counter-cyclical way, i.e., when prices were low and food was more available, there was a lot more food aid to be had than in bad years when prices were high and supplies were low. But since 2010, they've had a fairly large uh, cash program to the tune of some $300 million a year. The majority of the aid is still in, in kind. Um, we tried to get similar kinds of uh, data from, from other donors. I won't show you everything that we had here. This is in an article that's coming out shortly. Um, the data that we were able to get from, from um, ECHO actually came from, from Nick, and it shows the proportional changes over time in ECHO funding. 
and you'll see a, a much higher proportion of cash being used, a uh, much greater proportion of total support going to livelihoods response, and um, uh, a good deal more nutritional support as well in that budget. And this is all as a result of the new humanitarian food assistance policy that came out in 2009. Um, DFID has also championed the, the switch or, or the, the, the um, shift away from in-kind assistance to, to um, cash or, or voucher assistance. Uh, we weren't able to, to, to quantify that quite as tightly as, as the Americans, in part because it's been going on for a lot longer, and in part because it's not necessarily in a budget that was previously labeled food aid, as, as the U.S. one is. So all of this de um, suggests that with a greater range of choices, um, we, we need some mechanism by which we make those choices, and that is something that's come to be called response analysis. The first time that I recall hearing this term was when version 1.0 of the uh, integrated phase classification came out, and they described it as, as being the sort of link between situational analysis or, or um, needs assessment, if you will, and, and program design. And they depict it uh, as, as simply taking stock of the potential options that exist and, and then choosing one of them. Actually, I would like to convince you that, number one, it's a more complicated process than that. And number two, it doesn't necessarily sit neatly between um, needs assessment and response planning. That in fact, it, it rather pervades the entire uh, program cycle. But I have m edited out all my slides that depicted that because they were all, um, uh, I was given feedback on all of them that they were all confusing. So <laughs> I've, I've, I've left the original, I've left the original um, IPC definition in here to try and give you some sense of where this fits, but actually th this is this is far too um, far too simple a picture. I should say that our work was on was on food security responses, and in some ways the the, um, the range of new options is is so broad in terms of food security and nutrition responses that that has been the place where a lot of work on response analysis has been done. But uh, it's equally important in other sectors or other topics that we're not touching on here. Um, and it's also the case that some of the things that we're talking here are not specific to, to food security. I mean, it's especially cash and vouchers are now used in, in many sectors. Um, so in some ways, what we're talking about here is, is applicable to other sectors or to other, other interventions. But the focus of our study was on was on response to uh, to food security crises. So over the course of um, the past year and a half or so, we've interviewed something like 150 or 160 people, many of whom, uh, like some of you in the room, are sort of global experts or have a lot of experience in different places, and know something about this process. Um, probably interviewed everybody on the panel here at one time or another in, in one uh, capacity or another. We, we also under, undertook a, a fair amount of field work in the Horn of Africa, particularly Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia, working with, with field teams who actually make these choices as opposed to understand something about how the process works. Um, now, as you all remember, the last year and a half in in the Horn of Africa has been a slightly unusual time. There was a, an actual outright famine in in Somalia and a widespread, I mean, a, a, a region-wide crisis in, in much of the other countries. So to some degree, what we heard in the field was a little bit shaped by the acute crisis that was taking place at the time. We, th we, we think that these results are more broadly applicable to um, programs dealing with sort of chronic vulnerability as opposed to acute crises, uh, transitional programs, et cetera. We don't make any claim that this covers any and every kind of food security uh, intervention that might be devised, but particularly on sort of the humanitarian side of the house or transitional programs, safety net programs, et cetera. Um, what we tried to do through the research was really build up a picture of, of what people were doing, what kinds of considerations they took uh, on board as they tried to make a response choice. And there was already a fair amount of work going on on this. Um, both WFP and FAO had programs, one of them called RAP and one of them called RAF, uh, to try and map out a process. And both of those processes talked a lot about feasibility and a lot about appropriateness. 
they tended to, to focus more on those, but it wasn't necessarily clear exactly what they were talking about. <coughs> we talked with a lot of people and asked very open-ended questions about what do you do and what order do you do it in, and if you start here, what do you do next, etc. cetera. We, we deliberately shied away from asking questions about do you do this particular thing or do you do that particular thing. Uh, so over time, we kind of built up uh, a whole range of factors that influence the kinds of choices that people make about, about responses. Now, clearly, one set of those has to do with, with needs assessment, with, with causal analysis, et cetera. And, and that was already fairly well established. That wasn't what we were trying to look at, but we did want to know to what extent that kind of evidence played a role in shaping um, response choice, but then what else played a role. And of course, traditionally, you would have gotten two answers to that question. One was donor resources, and one was organizational mandate and capacity. Uh, organizational mandate and capacity, and perhaps more specifically program objectives at the field level for a particular program, or the um, mandate or mission of a given country office for uh, an agency, may have uh, um, also played a major role. We think there's something more to it than that, and we'll get to that in just a second. But there's clearly a lot of sort of internal factors that, that um, shape the way agencies make choices. And by the way, I should note, I, I should have noted <coughs> when I was talking about who we interviewed, we obviously interviewed the, the um, standard set of actors that you would expect, um, NGOs, uh, UN agencies, et cetera. We also made a point of trying to interview as many governmental authorities as we could who were engaged in, in not only response, but in making response choices. And um, we interviewed a number of the major donors, not all the donors, and we tried to interview as many local agencies as we could. So we were trying to get across the spectrum from, from global to local and from governmental to non-governmental, intergovernmental, and, and donor agencies. So just a couple of the things here that I would highlight. Some of these are not going to be surprising to you. There's been a lot of work done on market analysis. In fact, that's probably where most, th the biggest single um, effort has been made in improving response analysis. Uh, donor resources and, and organizational capacity I've already mentioned. Uh, much of this is now shaped by partner agency capacity um, and a number of other things that I won't take time to, to uh, describe here. You can read about them in the paper. One of the ones that really surprised us under feasibility analysis, however, was the third to the last one there about the cost of compliance. And it became clear as we talked to people that different kinds of programs have different kinds of analytical bars that they have to clear. So that, for example, if you want to do uh, a cash or voucher intervention with, with many donors, there's actually a higher level of analysis that you have to, to uh, conduct to demonstrate that you're not interfering with markets or that you're not um, undermining local production than there would be if there was an in-kind um, uh, kind of transfer going on. Now, that's not true of all donors. But it's true, it's true of several. And that was actually influencing the, the, the kinds of choices that agencies were making. How much time is there before we, we, we must act? Uh, and what's, the, wh what's going to be the investment in analysis if we go this way? What's going to be the investment in analysis if we go this way? And then there were a whole set of things about, OK, if, if it's feasible, is it, is it the right thing to do? Or is it an OK thing to do? And that kind of falls under, under um, the appropriateness side of, of this diagram here. Again, I won't go through all these. A lot of this has to do with risk analysis or risk assessment, and some of that overlaps with uh, the feasibility analysis in terms of markets. But a lot of it has to do with staff security, with the, the security and safety of recipient communities, uh, the risk of theft or of diversion or corruption, et cetera. Um, interestingly, one of the things we, we, we did not hear very often, and this is one of the reasons why we were very careful to only ask open-ended questions, was if there was any assessment conducted of recipient preference. Um, we weren't trying to do a quantitative assessment here, but um, we went back and looked at our notes, and, and fewer than a, th than a quarter of the people that we talked to actually mentioned anything about um, asking prospective recipients of assistance what kind of, what kind of um, response they preferred. And that was a little bit surprising to us, too. Now, like I say, this is a list that we made. Nobody, nobody showed us a list like this, and nobody mentioned probably more than half of the things that are on this list. Many only mentioned a, a, a small handful. So this was kind of our compilation of a lot of different factors that people take into consideration. 
how they fit together is, is, another, is another question. And of course, nobody showed us this. This is very much kind of a picture that we build up over time. But I, I think this is sort of the, this is sort of the takeaway uh, or bumper sticker, if you will, message from, from the whole um, research. And, and clearly, uh, there are some things about this that don't always fit. There's not always a huge shock that triggers um, the need for response analysis or the need for response. In, in many chronic uh, sort of crisis situations, it may be an annual needs assessment that triggers this, um, maybe something else. Uh, but a lot of what we heard in 2011 and 2012 was very much based on a, a, a critical sort of shock event, which was the combination of uh, region-wide drought combined with uh, extremely high um, food price inflation at the time, and in Somalia, um, conflict and um, counterterrorism uh, considerations, et cetera, as well. So all of that about needs assessment and about causal analysis I won't go into, but there are, there are uh, three sort of nested sets of decisions or nested sets of choices about options that became clear to us over time. And the first one is, is often kind of overlooked altogether, and that is um, kind of the, the, the overall uh, response or the overall um, way in which one wants to, to respond. Uh, some people refer to this as the sort of objectives level, and that is, is the objective to protect immediate uh, consumption or immediate access to food? Is it about um, actually protecting nutritional status of individuals? Is it more about protecting livelihoods and sort of indirectly um, affecting food security? Or is it about something else altogether? Uh, d does, the, does the analysis suggest that if one provided adequate access to water or health care, et cetera, that, that food security um, would, would follow in due course? Now, like I say, many agencies actually don't make conscious decisions at this level. They're already, they're already set in a certain track, and that track actually sets the kind of assessment that they do. Um, so in, in many ways, you don't actually see this being an overt decision-making process. It's something that's already kind of happened. Um, much of the action in recent years has been in what we call second-order um, options or second-order choices to be made, and that has to do with modalities. And of course, much of this has to do with, with um, the sort of cash and voucher or, or market-based responses compared to in-kind responses. Uh, but it also has to do with the, the, the whole new range of, of uh, nutritional interventions that are um, available and a whole new range of sort of livelihood or livelihood protection and resilience kind of interventions. And then th there gets to be uh, uh, what we call third order options that some people would probably legitimately call program design and not necessarily response choice. But we did find instances in which people actually had to go back and change what they were doing because of these kinds of considerations. And they, they revolve predominantly around the question of conditionality and around targeting issues. I won't go into that in, in too much detail, uh, just for the sake of time. But, but there are clearly um, this sort of nested set of, of decisions that have to be made or choices that have to be made. But in some cases, a third order choice or a second order choice can actually change what you decide to do at the first order level or vice versa. And there are a whole range of cross-cutting things that probably are legitimately um, more on the program design end of things rather than the response analysis thing. Um, but nevertheless, uh, issues like capacity, for example, or even issues like response uh, uh, recipient preference can change the kinds of choices that you make sort of earlier in the process. And needless to say, we've kind of schemed this out as though it were a rational, orderly um, process where you make, you know, one kind of decision first and that leads you to a second set of decisions, et cetera. In, in reality, of course, it's nothing like that. Um, but we were hoping that by laying it out this way, it, it w uh, people might be able to use something like this um, to impose a little bit of order on the, the kinds of processes that they already had in place. Um, Now, <laughs> a, a, a big question is, so, so is, I, is evidence actually shaping people's um, choice of responses, or is it something else? And we tried to depict this in several ways. Um, to, the, to the left, or sort of darker side of this diagram, both the, the big diagram and the individual balloons, are factors that seemed to us to be more sort of evidence-based. To the right, or the lighter shaded part, 
are factors that seem to be uh, more based on um, assumptions or on opinions or on deeply held uh, beliefs, et cetera. And, and the size of the balloons here, w w we, we tried to draw to represent what seemed to us after all these interviews, to represent how important or how, how uh, significant a certain kind of factor was. So again, both the big balloons and the little balloons somehow or rather um, um, influencing the choices people make. And as you can see, uh, there are some big balloons that sort of veer towards the, the left-hand side. So there is a lot of evidence that goes into making these choices. There are also a lot of things that, that influence um, decision-making that are um, largely not really based on evidence. You know, capacity and resource availability top everyone's list. Um, but to be honest, that's partly assumption and partly perception. Capacity, as, as we saw graphically with the cash response to Somalia, is malleable even in the short term if the circumstance actually demands it. And uh, donor resources, while they may still to some degree um, influence people's choices, are much more flexible than they used to be. And so it's really not, it's, it's really not fair to blame donor resources for why you'd make a certain kind of choice unless you um, ha have fairly deeply held beliefs about what those donor resources are or what they can be. And that big, that big green bubble on the, uh, on the right there, we, we labeled um, organizational ethos. And it, it kind of has to do with some things I've already mentioned with regard to capacity, with regard to mandate, et cetera. But it also has to do with some um, fairly deeply held beliefs. And those beliefs actually shape the way that evidence is interpreted and evidence is put into, into practice. Um, I'm not here to point fingers at any agency, so I'll do my best to uh, <laughs> make this story a little bit disguised. But, but uh, we, we were, we were, we were uh, conducting this research in the context of the Somalia famine. And those of you that followed the famine very well know that there was a, um, a big debate over whether cash would be an appropriate response in a large-scale emergency where, um, number one, food aid actors were simply not present, uh, with the exception of the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, but which had at its root, at least partially, uh, a major production shock or a major production failure, and whether or not cash would, would actually trigger um, higher food prices and, and therefore make things worse or would be an appropriate response um, given, number one, the lack of any alternatives, but number two, um, would it actually stimulate markets to, to respond? And th there were two analyses that were, that were done to address that problem. The analyses were based on exactly the same data because it was all data from the Food Security and Nutrition Analysis Unit for Somalia. And if you read them closely, those two different analyses come to fairly similar conclusions. Now, not exactly the same conclusions, but fairly similar ones. But different agencies use the results of those two analyses to justify wildly different responses, i.e., yes, not only is cash appropriate, but it's, it's, it's the most appropriate thing we can do and we better get, we better get, um, better get moving with it. Or, no, this analysis clearly shows that, that an injection of cash will cause food price inflation even above what we've already seen, make the situation worse, and unless we can do a major supply side intervention at the same time to guarantee that there will be a market response, we better shy away uh, from cash. Now, so, and, and that very debate actually delayed the response to the famine by probably two or three months. Um, the interesting point was it was all evidence-based, and it was all based on exactly the same data. So there, there, were, there were clearly something besides just evidence that was driving people's, um, driving people's choices. So needless to say, in terms of, of sort of nudging the whole process in an evidence-based direction, um, we, still have some, we still have some ways to go. Um, Part of what we were interested to do here was identify response analysis tools that were already out there, try to sort of map those a little bit to what decisions in our roadmap they actually relate and how they relate. Um, because there are a lot of tools that have been developed, but we didn't find a whole lot of evidence of their actually being used in the field. And there were several reasons for that. Number, uh, th they mostly had to do with their sort of technical complexity and how much time it took to do them, and uh, how much sort of expertise it took to do them. 
I, I'm, I'm partly responsible for one of these tools called, called MIFIRA, or the, or the Market Information for Food Insecurity and Response Analysis, I think that stands for. Um, and it turns out that people were, ha, had often used that in, in a somewhat inappropriate way. It's really a tool designed to help you with the cash versus market-based response. Uh, I'm sorry, market-based response versus in-kind response. And if in-kind response, should it be a, a local purchase kind of in-kind response or a transoceanically shipped one? Um, it turns out that <laughs> agencies felt like it took one of Chris Barrett's um, graduate students to come and do the analysis with them or for them to be able to use that tool. So it was far too complex and far too time consuming to use in the context of um, uh, certainly a rapid onset emergency. And there were a lot of other tools like this. Uh, uh, I, I've named some of them up here. This is by no means all of them, but it sort of gives you the, um, the uh, range of things. Um, so to, to us, the sort of big takeaway point from this was two. One is that evidence-based response analysis is, is, is not something that waits until you have a clearly defined problem and a clearly um, outlined situational analysis of that problem as it was depicted in, uh, it's, it's in the earlier slide that I showed you. It's, it's very much a part of um, contingency planning and preparedness in, in risk-prone um, contexts, and you can't really wait to do it until, until after um, a crisis has already taken place. The other thing is, um, we, we tried to map these to our, our, our little roadmap to, to, sh to show where these tools fit. Um, and there are some about assessment that we weren't really um, paying that much attention to. There aren't very many, actually, that refer to the sort of first order response options that we've talked about. There is a ton that relate to sort of second order options. That's really where a lot of the, 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 um, the action <coughs> has been or the analysis has taken place. And there's a few that refer to uh, the conditionality question or targeting to food and nutrition pro uh, pro products, et cetera. Um, and a few that, that sort of refer to the overall uh, process. But th the reason we try to map them out like this is to show that actually if you aren't trying to make a decision about a cash or voucher response, that all those tools in that box on the left-hand side there are actually not necessarily what you want to be looking at, number one. And number two, there aren't very many tools that actually walk people through the full process. So we hope that that's the contribution we've made to improve practices, to try and map out this process, number one, and number two, show people where um, the existing tools fit and might be useful. Um, but it's, it's you're a little bit late if you've waited until uh, a, a crisis has already taken place. Um, oh, sorry. So uh, just, just to wrap up then, um, sort of the, the, the so what question, um, how are we doing in terms of, in, in terms of improving uh, response analysis and making our response to not only acute emergencies but transitional situations and sort of uh, more chronically risk-prone programming context, more evidence-based. Um, we are actually hoping to, to, to conduct some, some follow-up research building on this that looks not only at um, the way people make choices, but having made, or the way that agencies make choices, but having made choices, what can one say about the impact of those things? And can we begin uh, building up an evidence base on impact that will actually make the response choice question more evidence-based? To be honest, most of these tools that are out there now, we call them evidence-based, but they're actually more sort of a logical analysis than, than they are necessarily an empirical analysis. So part of what we're hoping to do with, with the follow-up um, uh, research is, is to begin building up uh, uh, an evidence base about what choices were made under what circumstances and taking into consideration um, contextual constraints, taking into consideration managerial and sort of programmatic um, issues, what can we say about, about um, um, impact. So, you know, in, in some ways this is, this is still very much a, a sort of half-answered question. And the, the question about whether or not um, the investment in improved analysis and in the broader range of interventions is actually leading to improved uh, food security and improved um, recovery and so forth after crises um, is, is still to some degree an open question. Um, anyway, that's a very quick overview of what's in the paper.
I hope that the paper is, is useful to practitioners and we are um, always grateful for feedback. Dan, thank you very much for that really clear presentation.